Hi there, everyone. It's Dr. Manu Gill here with another episode of the Holistic Health Protocol. Revitalize yourself today to a healthier mind and body with whole being wellness. As you guys know, the reason for these summits is because it's our intention at our team to make health and wellness, particularly in the realm of functional and integrative medicine, accessible to everyone globally. What we talk about is not only limited to your physical health, but we also talk about your spiritual health, your emotional, and your mental, because all four of these components constitute a proper healthy living. So today, I'd like to introduce you to another amazing guest that I have on the show. Her name is Dr. Marina Buksov, who is a functional medicine pharmacist, a health coach, herbal educator, and a lifelong learner of the healing arts who is based in New York City. She is the creator of Build Your Holistic Herbal Practice Course, mentoring other healthcare professionals in clinical herbal medicine, as well as business skills. She also has a functional medicine pharmacist as part of the Farm to Table telehealth platform and is the host of the podcast, The Holistic Pharmacy. Marina, I'm super excited to get into this conversation with you today, and I really appreciate your time. So thank you so much for being here. Likewise, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it, it's going to be a great episode. And the first question I have for you is what I usually like asking all of my experts is can you just give us a little bit of introduction of who you are what got you started in this space and what motivates you each day to get up out of bed to serve the community that you do yes absolutely so it took me about a decade to figure out what i'm here to do personally and professionally and i had my own healing journey along the way which kind of informed me as well so after graduating pharmacy school, I really didn't feel like I belonged or fit into any of the amazing venues out there, which I was excited about before with all my internships and rotations. And I got a taste and a feel for all of them. But then I realized it fell flat for what I'm really, truly passionate about, because through everything that we learned about the pharmaceutical care model, I realized there's so much beneath that, the foundations and the pillars of health and environmentalism that's just not being addressed on a large scale. And I realized that we have to do the preventative public health measures and self-care measures in order for us to get to the peak of health with or without pharmaceuticals. So it's not about what is better. It's about what comes first, right? And what has to be in place as far as the foundation in order for the rest of it to work, because it just all falls flat. People come back in and out of the emergency room, chronic disease arising, healthcare costs are rocketing. And in the decades and even centuries before even pharmaceuticals were around, People somehow evolved and survived and even thrived, I would say, even with the nomadic lifestyle and our brains and our evolution are still working off those things that al allowed us to survive. But in our modern day and age, it's actually working against us in some cases. So we have to go backwards in order to see what is going to serve us going forwards. And I really think that history is important for us to look into. And so personally, I did go the pharmaceutical route and the conventional route for my own ailments for a long time. And I ultimately saw that it wasn't serving me because I was taking the medicines. And I say that loosely, the medications, I really don't think is the same as a medicine. That's another topic. But I was taking pharmaceutical medications. Then I was taking other medications for side effects of those medications, which I was taught as a pharmacist not to do because that's polypharmacy. But here I am doing all of the things because I'm being prescribed them. And then I'm also being advised to do surgeries and do like invasive procedures. So I'm doing all of the things and nothing is even A, helping and B, I seem to be getting worse. Frank. Something is not right and my body is not being supported. And then at the same time, I'm not satisfied with my career as well. And so I realized that I'm really a whole person. I'm not just my career. I'm not just my health. It mm -hmm. all works together. It all informs each other. So they're interconnected. Part of the reason why my health was suffering is because I wasn't happy with mm -hmm. where my life was going and vice versa. Everything just fell into pieces. I started going to other professionals and practitioners to try to get some answers and some relief 
from my mysterious ailments that modern medicine couldn't figure out. And it wasn't like a one size fits all answer either. It wasn't like, oh, suddenly I found the holy grail in alternative medicine. It was more like a journey and some things worked and some things didn't and some things brought relief. And it was a long game, right? Like a long term game. But what I realized is there is benefit and there is power in gentleness. And I did get so much relief using herbal and specifically traditional classic Chinese herbal medicine. So it got me excited to see, okay, what else can I use as a healthcare practitioner who has the pharmacy background? How can I educate myself in this other stuff? And how can I help not only myself, but potentially others? So that kind of got me curious to explore more courses, take certifications. And really now I am an avid proponent and advocate for herbal medicine specifically. And I think it fits so well with the pharmacy skills that I and my other colleagues already possess. Amazing. That's a great story. I really appreciate that. And that really just goes to show like a lot of the experts I've spoken to already, including yourself, and even my story is very similar. We all start off in this conventional approach, whether that going to pharmacy school, nursing school, medical school, doesn't matter. And then we we either have an incident in our lives where we fall ill and or we have health challenges, or we know people in our lives that fall to these health challenges. And the conventional approach just doesn't solve what we need to fix us. So that causes us to go ask ourselves questions internally and really come to an understanding that we may not have all the answers that we were looking for in this approach. And if there are other answers, and there probably are, then we need to do our due diligence to go out there and look for those answers and go find the answers to what we seek. So I think that's what really happened with your approach. You were in that field, being a pharmacist, going to pharmacy school. And then it's, in, especially in Canada and US, you know, prescription drugs are pushed so quickly and just so rapidly where we don't oftentimes hear the solution that it could just be your lifestyle interventions that could solve most, if not all of your problems. And that's where I think we don't need the stronger drugs like pharmaceutical drugs. Like they definitely have their place. Like I'm not saying that we shouldn't use them. They definitely have their place. But especially with these other treatments, like either Chinese herbal medicines or some type of other herbs in the Eastern part of the world, I wouldn't say they're necessarily as strong as pharmaceutical drugs. So if we do use them, we're not going to have to worry about getting some other side effects that we would if we were to use a super strong antibiotic, painkiller, or analgesic, whatever it is. I think it's great that you learned that approach as well. And one thing I wanted to ask you is, with some of the individuals that you're helping already, have you noticed a shift from when it was mostly pharmaceutical drugs they were being prescribed? And can you describe the change after when you were able to work with these individuals, putting them on some herbs that you've studied, like what have been some of the biggest changes that you've noticed? And can you comment on those? Yeah, absolutely. And I would have to agree with you as far as like how potent are herbs as compared to pharmaceuticals. And some of the things you mentioned, even antibiotics or prescription pain killers, such as opioids, they actually originally were derived from plants and it's just one phytochemical, right? or from fungi in the case of, let's say, a beta-lactamase or a beta-lactam rather antibiotic. So what we're looking for here is supportive measures, right? So we're working with the body, with the system that the body already has in place as far as feedback mechanisms, right? And we're helping enhance the innate ability to heal rather than giving it a sort of crutch, right? So here's the what's missing and here's what you should take. It's going to be a temporary fix because your body is not then trained to take care of this problem by itself. It's just a temporary solution, which is great. And you do need it in acute situations. But when you are playing the long-term game and when we are faced with chronic diseases, it's really a matter of building habits that are going to support your health overall. So every single choice that you make on a daily basis can be contributing to your health or taking away from your health. So I really see the biggest impact on my clients is the education piece and getting them on board with the building of the new habits and 
as a step-by-step -step approach, changing the paradigm. And of course, I'm working with people that are already open to the more Eastern or esoteric approaches or the more holistic minded or natural approaches. But even with those clients, it really is going to be a case by case individualized approach about what they believe to be true. Why did they seek me out? So continuing to go back to their why and their motivation and helping them get the results that they're looking for. And the more they rebuild their self-trust that they're able to take care of themselves and make the right choices because they may have been disappointed by the medical system or by other providers or by whatever ailments they have. And they really need to understand like, which factors caused these things and what they have under their control that they can start changing and what they're really willing to do right too and what their expectations are so it's not it's more complex than just a pill or an herb it's more so about managing expectations in general I think because like you said people nowadays if you tell them, hey, do this simple thing, chew slowly or whatever, or get more sleep, something that's free and accessible for many people, they won't even believe it or because they don't expect this to be a solution because they've been taught that the pill is going to be the solution. So if they come to you and you don't give them a pill, then they might think you're a bad practitioner and they're not going to come back. Yeah. So you have to re-educate this whole paradigm of what is medicine, which is why I said, I don't like to even use medication and medicine interchangeably. Like what is medicine? And that could be different for each person based on the conventional models that they grew up in and what they are expecting to receive here. And so what kind of care are they looking for? What kind of care do you provide? Are you a good fit? And then how do you continue to work together where you keep educating them and they keep giving you feedback? Amazing. I love that answer. And yeah, it's true. One of the biggest things is education of this subject is not very known. A lot of people don't learn it. They even like patients or people who may not be healthcare practitioners themselves, they know fully of the conventional method and the conventional model, but they may not be so quick to trust someone labeling themselves as a functional or integrative practitioner or doctor or a holistic health coach or anything like that, because like, they'll probably think, oh, what is that? But it's just a whole shift in not knowing the benefits of that whole side of the coin compared to the conventional side of the coin. And it's great that you're educating people about the benefits, especially because it's true, there are a lot of medications that are overprescribed. They're extremely potent. We shouldn't be taking the amount that we normally may. And that herbal medicine, it's very, it's not as strong. So it just won't be able to damage you as much as the counterpart prescription drug. But it's all a case-to-case -case basis too, because there are a lot of herbal supplements that are not FDA approved, that are not just properly regulated, like some of the other herbal supplements. And there's not that much research studies done on them because there's just not that much money to be made in that side of the industry. So it's not, they're not going to be very well funded to have that research done. I would recommend that people are working with a trained professional like you, who has that background, who knows about these herbal practices, these medicines, because you're working with it, you're certified in it, then yeah, go definitely work with that individual. But I do want to recommend to people as well, like some herbal supplements, like they do have a lot of toxic side effects. And the thing is, because they're not well researched on, you should really work with someone who has this knowledge before you take one on your own. I would even compare it to taking a medication, a prescription medication, without the direct supervision of a board certified physician and also the pharmacist, because it's these two people that usually will show you how to take that drug. So for people listening to this, before you take herbal supplements, make sure you're also taking that from someone who's qualified and trained enough to teach you about it and then prescribe it to you in the moderate doses. And another question I wanted to ask you is, can you explain in your own experience why is it so essential, especially in the year of 2023, for people to start incorporating more holistic practices into their lives to maintain health? Yeah, that's such a great question. And I do want to go back a little bit to what you said. Herbs, I actually see them in three categories. They are closer to whole foods 
is a major category. And then there's the medicinal ones, and then there's the poisonous ones. So obviously, depending on the category, you might have safer a safer therapeutic index versus a narrower one where you just don't even want to trial and error that, and especially not by yourself. So yes, absolutely, you need to work with somebody. And it's not even a matter of, is it regulated? Because it's not. But historically, what do these plans do, which is why studying it is so important. The history is important. So historically, we have a lot of evidence and we actually do have more lab emerging clinical studies and lab type of evidence and case studies and so much data that is emerging. So it's false to say there is no evidence. And also it's false to say that it's hundred percent safe or hundred percent dangerous. That's why it is important that you have a guide into this world. You don't just go online or Google it or Wikipedia. You actually study the tradition, number one. Number two, trust the sourcing of where you're getting this herb or the preparation or making it yourself. It is really just a process like anything else, but it does become second nature. But I would say even doctors and pharmacists that are not specifically trained in this will have no idea how to work with it or dose it and will just blanket statement that okay, we don't have enough information. But again, I do think that's a false narrative and it's just a matter of how do we trust this information? How do we verify it? And there are ways to do that, which is what I've done. And then to answer your second question, it is very important to do this nowadays and especially in the year 2023 to look to the holistic side of things is because we have just been in a pandemic, right? Not very long ago, we we're barely coming out on the other side. And we see that it is so important to be sustainable and sovereign and have agency over our health that the powers that be are doing the best they can. But frankly, they don't have what it takes to serve public health on the best possible scale. And it does depend on global policies or domestic policies. It does depend on our environment and the foods that we have access to. There's a lot of political and social reasons, right, involved with who can access care and what kind of care they get. There's a lot of insurances, especially like you said, in the Canada and the US, what's making it more confusing is the insurance policies, right? They cover some stuff, they don't cover other things. So it's very difficult to navigate, which is why other countries actually have embraced a more integrative model from the beginning, whereas we have this divergence, right? Where anything holistic is not approved and everything pharmaceutical is the only one that can be on the track to be approved, which just doesn't make any sense because until the last couple of decades, we didn't have pharmaceuticals, right? So how is that even possible that all of a sudden now this is the only model of care that we can go and confidently seek? So it's just a matter of asking the questions, right? Figuring out like, how did this historically happen in our two countries? And realizing that just like we humans have survived without drugs, we have not been able to survive without food. So food becomes one of the answers, right? We can use food as medicine, as Hippocrates said, who's the father of medicine, and we should be using it as me medicine. But what we've been doing is actually using food as poison. So it's it really ass assessing the foundations of health. Like how do we actually support the body with the proper foods? And how do we support the earth in order for the earth to continue to provide nutritious abundant, beautiful food that's actually healthy for us. And it's it's a lot of dismantling of what are we doing to our own crops with the chemicals, with all the pesticides and the herbicides and all the other industrial wastes, right? And all the problems that we have in the food industry. And then how do we do this on a large scale? And then on a personal scale, how do we learn more about the holistic approaches and preventative approaches to take care of our personal health? Amazing. I, that was a great answer. I, you really nailed down so many different points. And it's great what you said about herbal medicines. You explained three categories of it. That was a great explanation. And how just because you're taking a herb doesn't mean it's completely safe or it's completely dangerous, right? You need to, yet again, you need to work with someone who's trained, who studied these things, is certified, and can help you and teach you the things that we may not be able to read up on the internet because Dr. Google only has so much information that's accessible and the rest, we need to get that from a confirmed human source. So I appreciate that answer. And in your own experience, what you've seen with some of the clients you're serving, 
what have been some of the biggest barriers or challenges for people to try incorporating a holistic method to really start regaining their health in their lives? What have been some of the biggest barriers you've noticed? Yeah, so one thing is I think establishing who do you listen to, right? Because some people I've seen are seeing like 10 different providers looking for answers, like we mentioned before. So it can be frustrating and disappointing. And I've been there, right? Like looking for help and looking to all these experts, quote unquote, and then not getting anywhere. And then eventually you start to doubt that you are even able to take care of yourself or select a practitioner that will be able to help you. So you start to have this lack of self-trust and self-belief. And then before you know it, you set yourself up for failure with any one of those 10 practitioners and you don't really do what they're telling you to do or mixing and matching doesn't really work out because you're not really just following one. So I do think it's important to limit the amount of information that you're trying to implement and really do it one step at a time. And if you can't narrow it down to one practitioner, at least narrow it down to two or three main things that you're going to be focusing on with, and also let the practitioners know that you're doing all of these things and so that it's transparent and they could talk to each other, or they could at least tell you what to watch out for as far as not doing too many things, too many cooks in the kitchen, that doesn't work out. And then it becomes overwhelming for the patient to even, again, take anything to fruition because they're trying to implement a thousand things. So having somebody in your corner, one to three practitioners tops would be my kind of suggestion to start off with. And then make sure that you do have a respect and a trust in whoever you're choosing to work with. Because again, that's going to implement influence everything. It's going to influence your mindset, your belief again. Mm-hmm. And you can only really succeed at anything, including your health and healing journey, if you truly believe you can heal. And if you, your practitioner believes you can heal, and there's this mutual like synergy going on where both of your beliefs, it really will carry up. And it sounds like the placebo effect, and it is, but it's really important to have that in place because we are learning that the power of the mind is much, much more vast and especially the nocebo as well, where if we don't believe it or if we have some sort of doubt, then it's going to interfere with how the therapy is working. So it could be two people with the same exact diagnosis and like everything the same, but they're going to respond completely different to the same exact drug or to the same, like we try to pick out randomized controlled trials and really assimilate, assimilate very similar people, demographics, rule out all the confounding variables, and still there's these differences, right? So how do you explain that? And there's the pharmacodynamics and the pharmacokinetics, and there's also the mindset. So it's a huge piece of the puzzle. And I do believe it's important to like get that all out. And first of all, select somebody who's who you trust and who will believe in you and vice versa. And then just be really honest too about what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do and what the expectations are and really continue to have those conversations every single session and also not put so much pressure on either of you or from either end of it that, oh, this is going to have to work for me and just have a curiosity and a playfulness and experimentation of what if, what if I do this, what will happen and just be open to the benefits showing up. Great answer. I love it. And one thing I really appreciate that you said is that the practitioner and the patient need to have that synergy. And I've talked to a few experts about this, and it's super important that when a patient walks into your room, the practitioner give good, vibrant energy to them. And this is, I guess you could say it's on a metaphysical level, but you really have to be intentional with the patient. You have to want good intention for them. You have to show it on your face, in your muscles, in your tone, in your expressions, like everything. And there are stories there. There's people that may go to different parts in the world. It could either be in Africa. It could be in some places in Asia, even South America, where they may meet a shaman or someone that heals, quote unquote. And 
these people will meet that person and then they'll walk away feeling a million times better and then they'll get rid of their disease or their illness or whatever it is. And I know to a lot of people, they might think what I'm saying is absolute like woo signs or garbage. And I get it. Those sound very far fetched and out there. But what really happened in that exchange was that the shaman gave the patient or the person they were helping their energy they gave life force they were able to be present with them grounded they were able to express gratitude love all these things and that was able to transform the person from a very internal state of consciousness to improve their symptoms and actually heal this power is also accessible to practitioners if you're practicing in canada us or a different country it doesn't matter it's accessible to everyone it's just that you need to know when a patient walks into your room you need to be fully present and immersed with them in that experience and then give them that energy that they need to heal because that's the power of a practitioner so every practitioner has that pen and they have that ability right but it's just in it's on you to realize that it's in there and then you have to be fully present and grounded and committed to the person you're serving so you can give them these gifts of yours and another question i did really want to ask you is i've personally noticed that in the past maybe 10 ish 10 13 years since 2010 maybe onward the field of integrative and functional medicine really becoming more prominent i've noticed audiobooks podcasts some doctors and prominent scientists and great people that have been on talk shows, on podcasts, all these other things where they're explaining how to really heal your gut, how to take care of your well-being. They even talk about your spiritual well-being, your emotional and mental, because sometimes being in a conventional model, all we look at is physical and we don't really, we neglect emotional and spiritual. We might look at mental, but we neglect mental a lot too. How do you feel the holistic health the field of holistic health will evolve in the future in the next five to ten years do you see this field becoming more prominent do you see more people or students wanting to enter a certain type of school to go into integrative and functional medicine practices do you see maybe people that are in the conventional model switching careers do you see the or do you see the holistic model just vanishing into nothing what do you think we're where do you think we're going and how do you see that reflected I love it. First of all, I wanted to comment on like this healer, right? Or practitioner being a vessel and we're not creating or destroying energy. We're just simply transferring it, right? So it's not coming from us. And this may also sound woo and I come from like a pretty atheist family, but it really does whatever you call it, God, source, universe, creation, chaos, maybe. It does not come from you, but you get to be alive in this 3D form and you get to experience it and exchange it all the time. And you get to experience healing yourself if you allow the transference as well. That's a, an interesting phenomenon. And as far as how the holistic field will progress, I do think it's also a continuum, right? So healing and the mind and the body mm. is a continuum. It's not, you're not just a body and you're not just a mind, but, and just a particle, right? Of light. It's both a particle and energy. So it's the same thing that E equals MC squared. And we're able to be in both forms. We do experience these transcendental experiences, but we also have a body with which to experience them with. So we can just separate out these little mechanical parts, which again, it's nice to have that in acute situations where we have everything dissected down of what, what you know, the mole mole molecular infrastructure and like the chemistry, we're really good at biochemistry. But what we're not asking is like, how does this biochemistry mitigate itself? Why do we need something from outside of us to stimulate the changes biochemically? And the answer is, yes, yeah, sometimes we can, even from the plant world, it's not, it's outside of us, mm. but what it's doing, it's allowing our own biochemistry to function. It's not introducing a brand new particle that has to have this whole breakdown and then a burden our liver and kidneys, like we're always worried about. So it's both like what is going on internally and what's going on externally and what is physically happening, but also what we're perceiving as happening and how we're experiencing it is different from how somebody else experiences it. It's very fascinating. And I think, again, this curiosity about it is going to be a much better frame to look at it rather than 
judging it like, oh, this is bad or this is good. And I should be doing this and that, but my body is not doing that or feeling that. So instead, I think just being grateful and being curious and being present. And I think that's what holistic medicine is trying to teach us. And that's where our human evolution is going to and trending to, which is why we're seeing such a curiosity from the collective as far as going to these, what I call like heroic medicine journeys with plant medicine and other sacred medicines and with shamans. And that's part of it. And the psychedelic industry, right, where it is now becoming studied in actual laboratory settings for mental health. But again, we can't just separate mental health out and say, this is the cure for mental health. Once we heal one part, everything else is also going to change. Once you heal one part, it heals the whole, and that's the holism. Whereas the dissective and mechanical body parts of like, we specialize in this and this, we're only focusing on that. And then outside of that, we're not changing the rest of the physiology. And the holistic perspective is once you change one part, it's like a fractal part, and it's going to change the whole spiral web. So that's my answer. And I do think that outside of medicine and inside of medicine, this is where we're trending to thinking about these bigger picture and concepts and seeing everything and valuing these collective and personal purpose and mission and just seeing how every one of us matters as a part of the greater whole. And that's like the biggest holism that there could be. So yes, I do think there will be more schools cropping up. I see it all the time. I see like med schools like Cornell and other schools offering herbal certifications. So it's definitely growing. Great. That's, that is fantastic to hear. I love it. And yeah, it's to comment on one thing that you said about psychedelic mushrooms, they are being studied now in Canada, USA, they are legal in, or they're becoming partially legal in some parts in the U S and Canada. I'm not really sure of the legality and all the rules for both countries. But psychedelic mushrooms, I will say, they have a lot of research being done currently showing a lot of benefit. And I've personally experimented with psychedelic mushrooms myself. So I will comment on, I do believe fundamentally, if used under a right practitioner or a guide, or and you have the right intention and you actually take a dose not to just get high with the drug but actually use it with intention it actually can be used to heal i hope there are more studies done i wouldn't mind being a study subject myself <laughs> but there there's a lot of power in them and i do believe that they can heal either some type of physical illness even mental blockades or even emotional pain like it has been an extremely powerful tool for me even in the spiritual side of things just getting more reacquainted with energy that is source the universe so i think that was great but definitely people don't abuse it don't use the substance like it's just like alcohol or a cigarette it is a powerful substance and that should be used with a practitioner or someone that can show you how to properly moderate it and just guide you through the process um and another question i wanted to ask you is how in your practice how are you incorporating different modalities whether it be the integrative approach conventional approach maybe mindfulness practices how exactly are you taking care of your clients and how do you serve them the best you can? Yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, besides the mushrooms, we have plants, right, that have psychedelic and uh, journeying capacities and including plants like tobacco, right, where we see it abused in the industry of smoking and cigarettes, but it was a sacred plant. And once we abuse it, that's when we start being a slave to the plant's power and we get addicted to it. And cannabis as a psychedelic that we've been talking about for decades. And finally, it's also now being studied and legal and, and used medicinally. And now pharmaceuticals are wanting to jump on the bandwagon too. So it's so interesting how really the narrative can change so much of what we perceive and what we believe. And it's fascinating too, because we have used these plans again for ages. Then we were told okay, we have to stop, let's make it illegal. Then people continue to use it anyway. Then we're proving this X, Y, and Z things to it. And now 
the elite scientists and pharmaceutical industries are now finally saying, yes, let's do it. And now the rest of us can sign relief and things like that. But my point was that everything matters. What you said about intention, intention makes everything and the dose makes the poison. So those two things are like my two principal rules. And when we do anything with intention and mindfulness, the results are going to be so different than when you're doing it mindlessly or just because everybody else is doing it. Like, I believe that everybody has free will. That's our biggest superpower as a human. And we can choose to either do something or not do something or believe in something and not believe in something. And that choice is up to us, but I believe we should be choosing what makes us feel better, right? So if you want to choose to believe there's God, source, universe, and healing plant allies everywhere, and they're going to help me in my life here on earth, that makes me happier. So I choose to believe it and I choose to practice my life. And again, practice, I practice living and I practice working with people and helping them with their symptoms and their health. It's all a practice. Nobody knows a hundred percent of what the right thing is, quote unquote. And in my practice, I do love the idea of using like your personal power to make those choices that are empowering to you. And instead of trying to control everything, right, and being upset about it when it doesn't work out, it's take responsibility for what you can and really feel empowered when you do that. And whatever you can't, just surrender and just know that you are in control of reacting, right? So whatever happens in your life, you are always at free will to react how you see fit and how makes you feel better. And as long as you have that awareness and that intentionality, I'm here to support you and your choices. And again, judgment-free zone. And besides the love of herbs that I obviously have, and I encourage people to use food as medicine, both as food and like throwing in herbs and spices everywhere that we can. Again, just like being there for what is the person willing to do? Are they willing to throw a bunch of powders in their food or do they want a tea or do they want a tincture? So just really, again, that active listening and empathy. If they want the functional medicine labs, again, as a functional medicine pharmacist, I can help them with regular and functional medicine and interpreting that. But if they would rather not spend money on the labs, we have tools at our disposal. So it's about just having the tools and just choosing which ones resonate the most. And again, that mindset is so key. And I recently just did a positive intelligence program that I'm raving about. That's going to be something new that I'm starting to offer. And I'm already seeing incredible results with my clients. Wow. Awesome. I can't wait to hear more about that. And thank you so much for sharing that answer. That was a great answer. And one thing I wanted to comment, since we're talking about some tips that people can incorporate into their lives can you share some practical tips of how people can start incorporating some of these methods into their life? They want to do it, but they may not be sure of how to start and take that leap. So can you just give some encouraging tips on how people can start and what will allow them to stick to a plan for them? So I would say the essential thing is what we've already been talking about as far as trust and belief. So just trust that if you already have the idea and the curiosity in your mind that you're looking to explore something a little bit more if the herbs resonate with you or the mindset things that we've been talking about or mindfulness and like practicing intention just learn a little bit more about it as far as like practical steps to put it into your life and again just experiment just like a scientist what <laughs> if I do this what happens if I think this thought or what if I go outside and look at the sun or spend some time in nature what if I drink this dandelion tea yeah. <laughs> oh I noticed something with my bowel movements I don't know so just see what happens and track it and again and always just choose for what makes you feel happy and trust that if you're feeling a positive emotion, that means that this is good for you. And of course, this can be taken to extreme about, we were talking a little bit about addiction. I'm not talking about if you get, if you abuse substances, again, it's a different happiness. It's not real. It's not a real positive emotion. So I'm talking about intentionally observing what makes you feel good outside of a substance abuse relationship. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much for that answer. I'm sure that's going to really help a lot of people uh, trying to just get their feet wet on how to start. So now I think they'll have more of an understanding and a knowing of how to do that. 
And we talked about the pandemic earlier. And I just want to ask, how do you personally believe that the pandemic has shifted the way people are now viewing holistic health? What have you personally noticed? And can you comment? Yeah, absolutely. So I worked as a pharmacist in the retail setting through most of the pandemic until I had my baby. So I was also pregnant. And so it was definitely a very scary time. And I think that's the number one takeaway is like the fear, right? Of not knowing what's going to happen. And if you can handle it is paralyzing and it puts the body in this fight or flight, freeze, sympathetic overdrive, and it goes back to our primitive survival brain. And that's never an optimal state for us to enjoy life. We can't coexist actually with the sympathetic and the enjoyment, healing, happiness, which is the parasympathetic system. So uh, this is also like essential, just understanding how these two systems interact and how it drives our behavior. And we knowing that actually the best decisions and actions are going to be taken from that calm, peaceful, serene, parasympathetic state. And also, by the way, that's where the healing starts. So if you're already panicking and a virus comes into your life, it has way more of a chance to cause a lot of damage because, again, that mindset is not there. You're panicking and you're spending your resources on that fear and like fueling the fire of the fear. So we really need to have ways and tools to reset ourselves again to understand what is within our control and what's outside of the control so that we can stop wasting time and energy worrying about the stuff that we can't change. And this is also a Bible verse, even though I'm not a practicing Christian. But anyhow, we know that these things, even the Bible or the other religious books, they are powerful and even though they were written by humans, there's wisdom in all these things, whether you're going to be philosophical, metaphysics, or you practice Buddhism, or any other religion or philosophy that you ascribe to, or if you don't, you still see there's power in these historic things. There's yoga and Ayurveda, right? And the breath work and all of these mindfulness and presence things, or us saying things like the gift of the present moment, life is all about the present you realize over and over again, even though you study fancy things and functional medicine and herbalism and all these things that this is so true. Like you only have the present moment. So in the pandemic, when everybody's panicking and afraid of each other and like wearing masks and there are shortages everywhere, you people can't even get their medicines that they're depending on. This is a wake up call that we can't just depend on these systems. Yeah, it's great to have it as a safety net to have the medications. It's great to have a hospital. I am so thankful. One time the hospital saved me right? Pretty recently. So I am so grateful to have the safety net, but it is also my responsibility to take care of myself. And there's no judgment or you should do this, or I shouldn't do that. It's like, I have the free will and the choice that this makes me feel good when I feel like I have a little bit more control over my life and my body, right? So I do this. If you feel differently, that's you. I'm not going to be convincing anybody, but if you resonate and you also want some more control and feeling good and some more tools in the toolbox, you don't always have to reach for the same ones. You have a variety. Then it just serves us to learn more about what else is there. How else can I support myself, my community? And if there's a drug shortage, maybe I could take an herb. Maybe I could go to the sauna. So yeah. there's <laughs> lots and lots of things that we can do that we're just not taught. And that's a shame. And that's why it's up to us to teach ourselves. Yeah, definitely. I really like what you said about uh, we are responsible of taking care of ourselves. And it's true. You may have a doctor, you may have a nurse you're working with, a chiropractor or a PA or some type of functional medicine practitioner. But at the end of the day, that person's not going to save you. You have to save yourself. You're responsible for yourself, your own well-being. And if you can't take care of yourself, you're not able to take care of other people. So that's the biggest thing I've learned about when I did do my clinical clerkships in the hospital is that being a student doctor and then I didn't complete a residency for people that have to do residency, people that need to go complete their other boards and become a practicing physician or working in the healthcare field. A lot of them, you could just tell on their face, they're not taking care of themselves. 
like they, they're just not able to right it's not their fault it's just the system's designed that way these people are working long insane hours they don't get bathroom breaks like i've been there you don't get time to eat you don't you don't even get time to sleep or have social interaction or maybe get a workout in you're actually very busy you have to stay at the hospital and the hospital is a place where people go when they feel sick so the hospital's filled with germs other nasty particles and that's not really a good place to go maintain your health so one thing I want to say is that I hope more healthcare practitioners, especially, start taking more care of themselves because you are role models to patients. People look up at you as if you have all the answers figured out. And if you're not showing up that way, if you're showing up overweight, no offense to people that may be a little overweight, but if you're showing up overweight or you're showing up out of breath and you're telling a patient how to live their lives, they're not going to take you seriously. They're just going to take everything in one ear, take it out the other. They're not going to listen to you. So if you want patients to really respect what you're saying, you need to embody it and you need to be it. That way, if you tell someone, hey, you need to go to the gym and start, drop 10 pounds, they'll take your advice if you're a fit doctor. <laughs> You're going to be like, right, this guy knows what he's talking about because he's probably doing it. So we should probably listen to this guy. And that's how you're going to get patients to really understand what you're saying. So I hope that serves healthcare practitioners, just my two cents. <laughs> And can you share some of the biggest impactful or heartfelt moments you've had in your career? What have been the biggest wins for you just helping the community you're serving? Yeah, that's a really great question. First of all, I love the role model thing. And we all say that we're walking business cards, those of us that own our own businesses or serve as the face of our brands. And it's really meant to be inspiration and motivation. And also it's meant to be authentic and invite people into your challenges because I'm not saying, oh, life is perfect once you learn about herbalism, right? I have challenges every day as a person, as a business owner, as a mom, as a healthcare worker. And it is a shame that like our medical system doesn't allow for people to get their self-care and their breaks and people like can't eat or they have to go on smoking breaks to deal with the stress. And as a doctor, obviously, that's not a great look, like you were saying. And so we have to understand that conventional and alternative are not mutually exclusive. They serve very different functions and they're both important. So one is there as a safety net acute situation, right? And we do want that drug sometimes because it's fast and effective or the surgery is a good idea sometimes. But the problem is like we're relying on it and we're electing surgeries and we're electing to be on drugs when there are other ways so we have to lean into the more preventative overall everyday self-care and what can we do to support health versus like, how do we treat disease? Yeah. And it is a partnership too. Yeah, we had the whole authoritarian doctor and patient relationship before, but now we're seeing we really are a team, both with healthcare providers being a team and catering to the patient. And also we want to get to know like, the patient's point of view and honestly and transparently figuring out what's a plan they can get on board on with because some people actually won't take a medication that's why we have a problem with compliance and then we see them again at the hospital so some people will just agree with you because they don't see a way to disagree with you because it's not an open conversation it's just like okay here's my five minutes with you and here's a prescription yeah. and then so they don't have the time or space to even tell you their concerns and then when the pharmacist tries to tell them about side effects they're like why are you telling me about it? Because my doctor prescribed me already. So there's like this miscommunication of like, when should these things be done? And when should we talk about the preventative things before the drug is prescribed? It, it should be all of the above before, during and after we should still be emphasizing all the lifestyle things that people have access to. And again, just emphasizing those things. And yes, when there's a need I love that we have the acute care situation set up. And so we just need to restructure and reprioritize things. And so in, in my practice, I forgot the question, to be honest with you. Could you repeat that again? It was, what has been some of the biggest wins, like the success stories that you've had just helping some of the clients that you've yes. had? So some of my clients, like I mentioned, go to a lot of different practitioners, but I still was able to see that even with like gentle remedies of just like an herbal tea, right? Or just simple, like getting back into the self-trust or sometimes I, I would recommend like certain therapeutic touch, like craniosacral 
or my abdominal massage, castor oil packs. So things that are not specifically herbs or some things that I couldn't personally provide, but I just know that they would work synergistically in the body. So even with somebody that had been on a lot of different formulas, even those additions with the more gentle forms, right? Because we think of a tea as being much more gentle than like a capsule or even a tablet that the body has to go and break down. So we want to have those things where if somebody already is having a challenging time, like absorbing, eliminating, digesting, we need to have these other solutions. And even though, like you said, you might not see the results right away, they're not as heroic as the drugs or other big gestures, they add up. So they allow the body to recalibrate and accept these more mild support systems and allow for the micronutrients, which is something we haven't touched on. But the real problem is we don't have enough nutrients nowadays in the regular food that we eat, which is why we need either a supplement or a drug to help keep things going. But we, what we're really deficient is in nutrients love and self-belief. Like those are the three biggest deficiencies. And I've seen that even the gentle things, even my own life or my client's lives do matter, right? And the presence, holding the presence and just guiding them towards some of those things and allowing them. And yeah. again, sometimes it's a matter of not doing too much. So yeah. sometimes it's just nice to tell them, hey, just take it easy. Don't go to three massages a day. Just yeah. go to one massage a month right? You don't have to spend your whole life healing yourself and focus on what else makes you happy. Just going outside or going upstate instead of living in the city. And really it just becomes that holistic approach where you're not just talking about the herbs and the modalities, you're talking about their life. That's the point. And then other clients have been really resistant to herbs, even though they came to me for a holistic herbal approach. But we've been able to do a lot with just the food and the mindset as far as getting hemoglobin A1C down and getting some positive changes in both weight or just like mood and overall kind of feeling and, and the body piece as well, like feeling good in one's body. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that answer. And you're into the final round of questions now. So one of the last questions I have for you is something I'm curious about. I'm sure some of the listeners here are going to be curious about too. The question is, what do you do in a daily or in a weekly basis that allows you to live a healthy, fit lifestyle? So can you just walk us through, are you exercising every day? Would that be your weights? Would you do some type of yoga or meditation practice, whether that be breath work? Are you using deliberate heat or cold exposure, saunas, ice baths? Do you intermittent fast? And how do you use your essential oils? Do you maybe use it in a diffuser, in a sauna? What exactly are you doing to keep control of yourself and care of yourself? Yeah, I love that question. And if I tell you my whole routine, depending on where you are, you might think it's a lot. And some people okay. may think it's a little but I like to say that the morning is really important, right? How you start your day. So I do intentionally set some time in the morning to do like self-care before I even start like my work day because I work from home now. And then the wind down time towards the evening are the two like biggest self-care times for me. And I do both kind of mix routine with ritual in these things, be brushing your teeth or, or doing other kinds of like self-care hygiene, things like that could also be if you're a busy individual, which I'm sure a lot of us are in the modern world, you can combine it with just bringing more mindfulness to anything that you do choose to do. Because I've noticed even recently that I have the restlessness, right? I have like difficulty staying on tasks because I feel like I could be doing more and achieving more, like more. So for me, it's about reining in and just really being so present in what I'm doing because I find this to be the most valuable thing that I could do for myself at any one time and just continuing to rein myself in after having that awareness. In the morning, I do, I try to like stretch when I'm in bed. I sleep with my kids, they're little kids. So it's a little difficult for me sometimes to get out without waking them. So it's a challenge, but anyhow, I try to 
least be doing some stretches just when I wake up or doing some intentional breathing, even if it's not deep, just like being mindful. And then I like to record my dreams and I like to do what I now use as an app for the positive intelligence. So I have different lengths of meditations I could do there. So I do that for anywhere between two to 12 minutes, depending on the day. And then I will do like my mindful morning routine. Just, I don't have time for that much while I get my kids ready. And then I have a little bit of movement. So whether that's yoga or depending on the day, it could be dance, it could be Pilates, it could be just like a high intensity training. So it's not too long, but I do think every little bit counts. So even if it's 20 minutes a day, that's what I carve out time for. And then I'm mindful again about meal prep. And I see that as an act of love and care too for myself and my family. So I schedule in some time, if it's not every day, at least every other day to meal prep a little bit. And then I, again, I am using technology, I'm embracing it. I have the positive intelligence app. So it reminds me to three or four times a day, just take a minute or two to reorient reorient and be mindful. And it also gives me like little trainings here and there. So I'm still using that, even though I'm teaching it, I'm also a student of it. So I I practice what I teach, like you said, walking my walk. And then towards the evening, I really am now trying to be mindful of shutting down my work and being present with my family, because that's important to me. And so we either go outside together to the park, or if we can't do it all together, then I at least go by myself or with another a person in my household. And then we have dinner together. Again, a really staple thing that we used to have that is so hard to do anymore for people. So we've been implementing family dinner without distractions at the table, no TV kind of thing. And as much as I can, again, like either looking at nature or going out to nature, But at least a quick walk a day is what I at least make time for. And then just bedtime, trying to shut off screens Mm -hmm. at least half an hour to an hour before we're getting ready for bed and getting all the kids ready and all of that. So it it may sound, like I said, like not that much. Um, Essential oils, I will say I'm very sparing about essential oils because I'm an herbalist. So I understand how much herbal content is needed for the oils. I have tea all day long. That's part of my self-care. So I'm brewing herbal tea every day, but the oils I'm very sparing. So sometimes I will put like some Epsom salt baths or some smelling salts as I shower or take a bath. But outside of that, I don't use essential oils too much, except for maybe products that are in my topical skincare. And then for intermittent fasting, I don't purposefully do it but I tend to stop eating like around two hours before bed at least and then when I wake up because of my morning routine I end up eating like about two hours after wake up so it does end up to be like at least a 12 hour fast yeah that that is amazing thank you so much for sharing that I'm sure a lot of people here are going to try incorporating some of these methods into their lives and just seeing what really works for them and how they can put it into their blocks in their calendar each day so thank you for sharing that And the final two questions I have for you, what is the single piece of best advice you've ever received in your life? And the follow-up is what is the single piece of worst advice you've ever received in your life? Wow, these are good ones. So I think the first one I will say, turn around the why to why not, or at least, or if, what if, and what if it does or what if it doesn't so just even if you're starting from a negative emotion or a mind frame how do you shift that around and just do the opposite if you doubt the outcome why don't you doubt that it won't be that outcome (laughs) so like a double negative sort of way to get yourself to think more positively and the second the worst piece of advice that's good okay so the worst piece is probably oh do what everybody else is doing (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that never works. (laughs) No, you have to be yourself. Like you're never going to be happy if you're not self-actualizing. And that has to come from you, the self. You can't, like me, oh, thinking pharmacy is going to be great. So I should go become a pharmacist, but I'm not happy like practicing like other pharmacists. I need to make my own thing. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) I can totally relate with that. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, I could totally relate with the last piece of advice, especially from being a doctor, not wanting to pursue residency or fellowship and just wanting to do my own thing, serving the community, how I feel is better. And it's just been a lot more beneficial for me. So I'm happy I chose this path. And I'm sure you're happy with the decision you made being from the conventional approach. And I just want to say, Marina, thank you so much for being here. You're an amazing guest. I really appreciate everything that you shared with me and the audience today. I learned a lot. I hope the audience learned a lot. And to the audience, I just want to say Marina has been extremely generous today, not only with her time, but she's also offering everyone here a free gift as well, which we're going to be pasting the URL in the show notes below, along with what Marina's socials, her website, and all these other places where you can find her. So you can go and support her, show her some love, go see what she's about. But Marina, would you like to explain what exactly is this gift that you're offering everyone today? Absolutely. So I'm excited to share my natural medicine makeover guide. So if you're like me and you want to be more health conscious about what you're putting in your body and as far as like first aid for yourself and your family or go-tos, since I'm a pharmacist and I get all these questions all the time about what can I use without a prescription for this or this to self-treat for those kind of limiting conditions that you can self-treat, I have given you a variety of the categories that I have seen the best results in myself and my clients. Wow. Thank you so much. I really hope everyone here is going to go click on that link and really learn exactly what it is that Marina is offering you guys and go ahead and take advantage of that generosity. I just want to say, Marina, thank you again once more just for being here, really teaching us today. I want to thank the audience for being present and listening to everything that we've been saying. And I also want to say, we are almost done wrapping up the first season of the Holistic Health Protocol. We still have a couple more episodes to go before we finish up wrapping season one. So I just want to say you definitely don't want to miss the last couple episodes we've got coming because we still have more amazing guests where we're going to be talking about all things health and wellness related in the approach of functional and integrative medicine that will allow you to take back your health physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. So until the next few episodes... We're signing out and we'll see you then.